Assalamu alaikum. We'll start one more time. Uh, again, my name is Ahmed Bayoumi, and uh, I'm honored that MHP uh, and MAPS asked me to participate in the Health Halaqa series. Um, tonight, I'd like to focus on bone and joint problems. Uh, I hope to keep this informal and give a broad overview um, of some of the problems that people face day to day and give you ample opportunity to ask questions, inshallah. So, as we go along, don't, don't mind raising your hand or interrupting if you have a question in mind. Um, in brief, um, I'm going to start by describing what orthopedics or musculoskeletal medicine is, and that's the study of bone and joint problems and how to treat them. Um, we'll talk about the, the importance of this topic, why it's relevant to you all, who provides care for these sorts of problems, what the most common problems are, and what are some preventative things that you can do in your own health to try to avoid running into bone and joint issues as you grow. Uh, and I'm gonna segue in the middle of the talk to talking about injuries and emergencies going from daily aches more to urgent issues. Um, some of the folks in this room may have experienced orthopedic issues already, but if you haven't, I'd like to lay out what you might expect when you go to the clinic or the hospital. Um, and I'll close by mentioning some local resources and online resources that you can go to uh, to learn more. So problems in the bones and joints are very common. Uh, in fact, one out of every two adults in the United States has a chronic problem, meaning a long-standing problem that's bone or joint related. Uh, that's actually twice the number of people that are affected by heart disease or chronic lung disease. Um, many people have arthritis, which is wear and tear of the joints. Um, many people have neck and low back pain, and so I, I imagine some of the folks in this room might echo that sentiment. Sports injuries are also very common, and that's something that we take care of as bone and joint providers. Um, and as folks grow older, uh, the density of their bone goes down, their bones become weaker, and they're at greater risk for breaking their bones, and that's something that's becoming more common as the population gets older. Uh, this is just illustrating that point I mentioned that people with musculoskeletal or bone and joint problems uh, represent over half of the chronic medical problems in the United States population, far more than heart or lung issues, as important as they are. I think this is also a good setting to remind people that the more that you know as a person with a condition or a disease or as a patient, um, the more that you can educate the people that are taking care of you. So in 2010, this uh, article came out in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, which is the leading publication for people who take care of bone and joint issues. You can think of it as our Time Magazine, if you will. Um, and some very uh, forward-thinking um, brothers at different institutions around the country put this together and if you read the article it gives a very nice overview of Islam what Islamic practices are like including the physical aspects of Islam such as praying and they show this figure um, of a gentleman who's making uh, Rukur and Sajda um, and uh, this is this is this is just a start so as people learn more um, and educate the people who are taking care of them more hopefully uh, that'll give you better care down the road. So on that note, who, who provides care for these kinds of problems? Um, I have to start by recognizing our uh, colleagues who provide primary care or general practitioners. In the United States, that's folks who've trained in pediatrics, internal medicine, or family medicine. And they take care of everything. They're supposed to be your overall doctor. And one of the most common things that they see when people come to the clinic is a bone or a joint issue. So that's a starting point. People with that background might do additional training to focus on the bone and joint system. Uh, they may be more interested in sports injuries and irritation or inflammation of the joints, and that's rheumatology. And then doctors who focus on taking care of our older population uh, are geriatricians. Some, some problems benefit from being managed through medications and exercise and other things that I'll touch on, but other problems require surgery. Um, and there's a number of different providers who go down that route. Uh, I'm training to be an orthopedic surgeon, 
Uh, but neurosurgeons, plastic surgeons, and podiatrists are all types of doctors who take care of these issues. But there are a lot of other people that you'll come across when you seek this care, and they're all important to the team. Nurses, chiropractors like Brother Masoud, who's joining us tonight. Uh, we have nurse practitioners, PAs, therapists. There's, there's a whole slew of people. Um, and even if you were to have surgery, these people are still integral to your care. So, why don't we take this time to transition and talk about what are some of the common issues that face kids and adults when it comes to the bone and joint system. I mentioned arthritis before. Um, arthritis, in sum, is pain in one of your joints that's related to wear of the joint or your body attacking the joint through inflammation. Uh, the most common type of arthritis is wear and tear in our older population hips and knees. Some of the folks here may have a friend or family member yourself who's had a joint replacement related to arthritis. Um, neck and back pain is a common thing. It's one of the most common things that um, working adults fa face in this country. Um, and it's important to mention that bones and joints help you move, but nerves help you to accomplish that. And nerves can get pinched and can be a source of pain, inflammation, and disability. Um, we have some of our youth playing basketball across the way. Inshallah, all of them make it home safe tonight, but uh, injuries playing sports are also a common thing. Uh, orthopedic surgeons have a reputation for just being doctors for broken bones, and that's a big part of what we do. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit more later. Uh, less commonly, but also important to mention that there are other issues that come up that um, can really impact somebody's life that relate to the musculoskeletal system. Cancer, you can have cancer of the bone or the muscle, um, and it takes a lot of people taking care of you to get through that. Um, infection is another thing that I'll mention when we talk about emergencies. So, in terms of prevention, uh, what are the, some of the things that we can all do to try to nurture healthy bones and joints? Um, one of the things that we can start with, and it starts actually during your teenage years, um, is to develop good nutrition and to get used to doing low impact exercise. Uh, riding a bike, walking on a treadmill, anything that you like to do for fun uh, but doesn't wear on your joints is healthy for developing your bone strength. And as you grow older, you're gonna rely on that strength to prevent fractures. Um, we live in Seattle and have a reputation for not getting a lot of sunlight. And one of the ways that you make vitamin D in your body is by absorbing sunlight. So doctors in this area may recommend to people to take more vitamin D in their diet. And that, along with calcium, can allow you to help build bones. Injury prevention is key. Um, you know, inshallah, everybody, or inshallah, none of you run into this, but um, car accidents are a common cause of orthopedic injuries. So making sure that you wear your seatbelt, um, wearing a helmet when you ride your bike. Um, if you're somebody who has difficulty walking, making sure that you use your walking aids and using any protective gear for different sports that you participate in. Uh, you know, there's the old adage, sound mind, sound body. And it's important to mention that how you feel in terms of your mood can affect how your body feels. And one of the most common things that we see is that people who have uh, depressed mood or feelings of depression may have aching joints and it's important to talk about those things with the person that you trust whether that's your healthcare provider a family member uh, your uh, imam or youth group leader somebody who can help you to find the right care for those issues so we're going to talk a little bit about what happens if you've had an injury and uh, the first thing I want to do is reassure everybody that inshallah um, you're in good hands, whatever happens, but if it does happen to you or your loved one, these are some of the things to keep an eye out for. Um, if somebody has new, abrupt pain with movement, bruising, swelling, redness, breaks in the skin, it can seem like common sense, but you'd be surprised how some people just don't think to pay attention to these things. These are all signs that somebody is developing an infection or has had some kind of an injury, whether that's a broken bone, or a joint that's out of place. So one thing you can do is call your doctor. If you already have a primary care doctor, 
that's great. And this is a theme that I'm going to continue to come back to tonight. It's so important to have somebody who knows your overall care and who you can go to during business hours. But if they're not available, you can go to an urgent care clinic. And I'll talk a little bit about what those offer in terms of resources. A third option is to go to an emergency department at a hospital. That's where people go if they have a real emergency. But you may not know what a real emergency is, and sometimes that's the best option, just to have somebody take a look and let you know. Um, there are downsides to this, and I'll touch on those in a little bit. Of course, it goes without saying that anytime you are concerned about a serious injury or you can't get to care, you should call 911. An ambulance will come to your house and take it from there. So please know that that's available to you. One of the concerns that comes up when people are thinking about where they're going to seek care is the issue of health insurance. And alhamdulillah, here in Washington, uh, as a state, they've developed a plan to try to encourage people to have health insurance or to provide them with insurance if they aren't getting it through their employer or if they can't afford it. Um, and if you haven't already been to the Health Plan, health plan Finder website, um, the, you can just Google Washington Health Plan Finder, learn a little bit more about it. And if, if you take nothing else from tonight, maybe just check out that website if you don't already have health insurance. So, I thought we'd talk about some examples of what orthopedic injuries are like. And um, I'll let somebody in the audience take a try. Can anybody tell me what they see, what that image is up on the screen? Yep. Is there something wrong with the arm? It is. Yeah. Yeah, so I think a few people have caught on and it's, uh, it's not hard to see that <laughs> um, he's, he's, he's a little bit advanced. So this is an x-ray of uh, a child's arm and they've broken both of their forearm bones. Um, alhamdulillah, kids have an incredible ability to heal. And um, if, you, if this were to happen to your family member or your child, um, one of the things that you can expect is that with the right care, this would go on to heal really well um, without any kind of surgery. So even if something is an emergency at the time, alhamdulillah, we're uh, optimistic that these things can get better. Um, this is an x-ray uh, of uh, an adult, and it's their pelvis. And I wonder if anybody can tell me what's wrong with this x-ray. Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, unfortunately, this person has popped their left hip socket out of joint. And that's what you see on the left-hand side. The ball sitting in the cup has moved out of place. And this is actually an emergency, no matter what age you are. Um, and it's something that you need to seek out an emergency department for as soon as there's a suspicion for it so that somebody can put that hip back into its socket. Um, you know, we only have a limited amount of time tonight, but one of the important things about keeping bones and joints lined up is that it decreases wear, decreases pain, and reduces the, the likelihood down the road that you'll have a stiff joint that's painful to walk on or painful to move. Um, and so this is considered an emergency and something that we uh, unfortunately see commonly. Uh, there are probably some soccer fans in the room, and uh, soccer players uh, not uncommonly uh, tear ligaments in their knees. And ligaments are ropes that connect your thigh bone to your shin bone. Um, and sometimes these heal without surgery and sometimes they do. This is a picture of a man who's developed an infection in his right knee. You'll notice that the knee is red, it's larger than his other knee, it's swollen, and I can tell you that this person has a lot of pain trying to move that joint. This is also an emergency because anytime you have an infection inside of a joint, um, the bug that's causing that infection can damage the lining of the joint surfaces. And your body, in trying to attack that infection, sends in its troops, if you will. And when your body reacts, not only does it attack the infection, but it attacks the joint lining and the bone. 
And if this goes untreated, it can completely destroy somebody's joint. So um, it's one of the difficult things for doctors to diagnose because there are other conditions that cause inflammation in the body and can look just like this. But if this is the first time something like this has happened to you, it's important to be seen um, as soon as possible so we can make sure that it is or isn't an infection and then go from there inshallah. Uh, I thought to outline some of the things we saw on the previous slide and one other thing I'll add and we'll talk a little bit about its signs later uh, is when you have a pinched spinal cord that's usually in your mid to lower back and we'll touch on the signs of that shortly. We have a little bit more ways to go but I wanted to pause and see if anybody has questions about what we've talked about so far. Okay. So we've talked about some of the problems, and we can discuss some of the treatments. Um, this is something that we use across medicine. Sometimes the body is going to heal itself on its own, and what you need to do is rest and give your body the chance to heal. Uh, you could think of that as watchful waiting or observation. Um, if you're, you know, working out on the deck one day and you twist your knee or you strain your back. It may be really painful that day, and it may get better, it may not. Um, oftentimes, if things aren't getting better, it's a sign that you need to see your doctor. They may suggest using anti-inflammatory medications, uh, visiting with a physical therapist, uh, avoiding those activities that are causing you the pain, and sometimes just plain simple ice will do. Um, we talked a little bit about dislocated joints, broken bones, um, many of which need to be set, put back into place. And this is something that requires a procedure. So if you're gonna be, uh, if this happens to you, you can expect to spend some time at the hospital so that the specialist can come see you and address the issue. The next step is often just to rest the body part that's bothering you and just let it heal. Um, if you've ever seen somebody walking around with a sling, that could be because they have a shoulder injury and an elbow injury. Um, and there are some broken bones that heal perfectly fine just by resting them in a sling. Uh, I'll show you a picture shortly of a brace or a cast, and that's a way to keep two bones from moving against each other, allowing the, bo the bones to heal. Um, infections uh, often get diagnosed by having somebody take fluid out of the joint that's suspicious. I showed you the picture of the big swollen knee before, and um, that's usually a step to figure out if there's infection inside. Uh, and finally, surgery. Uh, you know, uh, surgeons who are training are taught the value of putting surgery off until somebody really needs it. And uh, it's always a last resort, but alhamdulillah, some surgeries really can make a difference and are the best treatment we have for some of these problems. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, earlier I talked about low impact exercise, but some people, for example, like to run and they may go running on pavement. Um, and if you're somebody who runs on pavement for years and years, uh, that can really wear on your knees. Uh, same is true for example, playing basketball. Um, if you don't have good shoes um, or you uh, don't have great technique, you're at greater risk for developing an injury. So it's not uncommon that somebody develops, you know, say soreness in their calves or their shins if they've started a new exercise program. And if you visit with your doctor, um, the first thing they're probably going to suggest is to take it easy, just let things rest. Um, and if it doesn't get better, there are more steps you can take. So that's one example. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. So um, we don't walk on our hands, right? But there are people who develop really bad arthritis in their shoulders. And they do that from years of the type of work that they do, whether they're a farmer, heavy laborer, um, or somebody who's always doing activities above their head. 
and just by gliding those two bones against each other can wear down the lining in between them called cartilage that lets it glide smoothly and without pain. Uh, and over time, absolutely, that joint can wear out, even if it's not one that you're putting a lot of weight on. Great. Inshallah, we'll continue. Um, I just thought to show some pictures of some of the treatments that I mentioned in the slide before. Um, the two gentlemen on the lower left um, are doing physical therapy. And I think people don't have a good appreciation of what a physical therapist does. They're really talented people. They do a lot of things. Um, they can help you recover from an injury, recover from surgery. And one of the best things they can do is teach you how to exercise in ways that will protect your joints, will prevent stiffness after you've had a surgery, and allow you to rehabilitate after you've had an injury. Um, the picture on the upper right is an example of two orthopedic surgeons using a microscope to repair a nerve that's been cut. And you can actually reconnect those nerves, so that's something that we do. And the people wearing the strange spacesuits on the lower right are orthopedic surgeons who are replacing a knee joint that's been worn out by arthritis. So, I wanted to touch on some red flags. I've talked about some of them earlier, but inshallah this doesn't affect anybody in the room, but these are just things that I think everybody should know. Just like you know the poison control number, you should know that these are some red flags to look for if this ever happens. If you, oh sorry, did someone have a question? If you develop sudden back pain and your arms go weak, your legs go weak, within a matter of hours, you have difficulty using the bathroom, whether that's urinating or having a bowel movement, that's an emergency. And that's, that raises the concern that you may have a pinched spinal cord. We talked a lot about that red hot swollen joint. If it's the first time happening to you, you should seek out a doctor that day, ideally within hours. There are people who have other conditions that we don't have time to go into, like gout or a type of arthritis that is not wear, but rather inflammation from the body. And these things actually happen to them frequently, if you can imagine, and it's very painful. But alhamdulillah, most of the time, it's not an infection. But if it's the first time happening, or if it's happening in a new joint that hasn't affected you before, it could be infection, and that's what we always worry about. Let's talk a little bit about kids. And kids have bone and joint problems that are a little bit different than adults, but they can have emergencies as well. So if you, let's say you have a toddler who's of walking age, and then they all of a sudden stop walking, or they become irritable if you try to move them around or uh, rest them into bed. That's a, that's a concerning sign that they may have developed a hip infection, and that's a reason to go to the hospital to be checked out or be seen by your doctor. Last but not least, if, if, if you see any of these signs, please don't hesitate to go to the emergency department, and if you need to call 911 to take you there, go ahead. All right, so if you haven't been to the hospital or the clinic, what's it gonna be like? You're probably gonna hear that, unfortunately. There's gonna be some screaming people around, and, and I don't want you to get alarmed by it. Um, everybody is gonna be evaluated when you go by a provider, whether that's a physician's assistant, a nurse, or a doctor. And they're always gonna talk to you about what's going on, that's taking a history, and they're gonna look at you and they're gonna move your body parts around, which is the physical exam. It's important for them to be able to check everything, but they're gonna focus, obviously, on the thing that's bothering you the most. And this might happen multiple times during that visit as each person comes to see you, uh, including any specialist that might be called. After that, most people who are going for a bone or joint issue are going to get regular x-rays. Um, regular x-rays, we showed a few already, many of you already had them, are fairly safe. They create a, a very low, low dose of radiation, much lower than you might get, say, flying cross-country on a flight. Um, but they give us a lot of valuable information and they're relatively inexpensive. Some people need to have more. And that might involve blood tests, more advanced scans like CAT scans or MRIs. 
and potentially you may not have all the resources you need at that hospital or that clinic and they'll ask you to go to a different facility either by your own vehicle or just transfer you um, and I'll touch on that a little bit more in a bit so I earlier I talked about some of these different places you can go and I want to go in a little bit more specific in terms of what you'll find at these sites so your primary care doctor may or may not be able to get you in the same day but they can take those regular x-rays and can provide some of the basic slings, boots, and splints that I touched on. If you go to an urgent care clinic, usually you can be seen fairly quickly, right away. And they have some of the same uh, supplies there, but there are usually no specialists on site. So if you go to an urgent care clinic and it turns out that you have an issue that's a little bit more advanced, you should have the expectation that they're gonna transfer you to a place that has that specialty care. And some people will say, well, why go to the urgent care clinic to begin with? And, you know, it's, you're not a doctor and you may not know, the, you know, may not know where the emergency is and so it doesn't hurt to start there um, and then they can direct you if needed. So emergen emergency departments vary, hospital by hospital. Uh, smaller hospitals have limited resources compared to bigger hospitals like bigger private hospitals or university hospitals. Because of the size, you may end up waiting hours to be seen when you go to an emergency department. And that's frustrating for you and your family um, and can be tough, especially if you have a really time sensitive problem. If you go to the hospital though, it's sort of the, that's the last point. That's where you can go and you know that somebody there can hopefully provide you an answer or get you to the place that can. And I would say be prepared that you might end up staying overnight, which is being admitted to the hospital. Sometimes people think that they'll just go and be able to go home and come back and have the problem dealt with another day. But if this is really an emergency, talk to your family, let people know that you're going and, and have that expectation in mind so that if you need to stay the night, you can. Um, we can't give a halaqa and uh, the east side of Redmond without talking about technology. And I just want to touch on some pearls when it comes to being um, an educated patient and leveraging, leveraging technology. Anytime you see a doctor who's referring you somewhere else or you're being transferred from one hospital system to another, always, without exception, request a copy of your records. This is so important. You would imagine that in today's day and age of cloud computing and these other things, that it would be easy to share this information, but I take care of people all the time who've come with no paperwork, no scans, and it delays your care, it creates frustration for you, and it creates a lot of additional cost and, and delay in your care. So if you can, try to make sure that you take a copy with you. Um, and these are some of the specific things that you can ask your doctor for. If you've had any x-rays or scans, try to have somebody give them to you on a disc not just the reports, we appreciate that the radiology doctors can interpret those reports and tell us what's going on, but if you have the pictures themselves on a disc, um, that's gonna be very valuable. If you stayed overnight in the hospital or had a surgery, there are gonna be notes related to that, an operative report or a discharge summary, and that's the most valuable thing to tell your next team about what happened to you and what care you received. Um, I want to talk a little bit about MRIs because um, it's a question that I receive and um, they've become popular and a lot of people think that an MRI is going to tell you everything. Alhamdulillah, this is an amazing technology and it gives us a lot of detail about the body, uh, the soft parts of the body, the bones um, and fluid in the body. But if you're going to have an MRI, it really should be ordered by somebody who's ready to interpret or decode what that MRI means. Um, because not all MRIs are alike. If you've had an MRI of your shoulder, you could have had it done four or five different ways that give you different information. And you don't wanna be repeating that if you can avoid it. Um, the other thing about MRIs is that, again, because it's such an amazing technology, it gives you a lot of information. But not everything on an MRI that is abnormal is necessarily gonna cause you problems in your life. In fact, most adults in the United States who have had an MRI for other reasons 
are found to have signs of wear and tear in their lower back, but actually don't have any low back pain. And it's only a portion of people that have low back pain that actually <laughs> might have a finding on an MRI. It's amazing, and maybe down the road our technology will change, but just be mindful that just because there's a problem on the scan um, doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna affect you. Just have a conversation with your doctor. And again, plain x-rays are sometimes all you need. So, inshallah, we'll be winding down, I think, for Aisha in the next few minutes, and I'll close with a, a few items. Um, sometimes people ask, where should they go to get their care? And I'm disclosing that this is my bias um, based on my training in the Seattle area. If you've had any major injury, a car accident, a really bad fall, or an injury on your work site, Harborview Medical Center, in my opinion, is the best place to go. It's the center for the entire Western United States for taking care of the most complex injuries and people who are the most sick who've been injured. Um, and they, people fly in from all over the country to get, to get their care there. Harborview does something else, which is that it's the county hospital for King County, which means that it provides care for anybody who walks in the door. And as a county hospital, you get a lot of different people. And um, if you go to the emergency department, just know that the crowd around you might be a colorful crowd. It could be rowdy, it could be alarming. Um, your kids or your family members may not be comfortable there, but that's just the nature of an emergency department. And at Harborview, it's sometimes taken to um, kind of a significant level. So, um, but it's worth it. It really is if, if you need to, if you need to get, get that care. And for the folks in the room who have kids or teenagers, really, if you have any emergency concern, my individual opinion is that you should go to Seattle Children's Hospital. There are plenty of other hospitals in the area that provide care for children, um, but if it becomes any complex issue, you're gonna end up going to Children's. They'll transfer you there. So if you're able to make the drive across the bridge, you can go to Children's. And one of the advantages of Children's is that you may, need, may not need to go to the emergency department, but actually their urgent care clinic, which is in the same building. So if you can imagine, you can go be seen fast, usually within an hour, by the same people who are working at the hospital, same training, same level of competency, who can take you down the hall to the emergency department if they identify something that's really bad. And inshallah, that doesn't happen. Of course, there's a lot of other great hospitals in the area. And on this Google Maps snapshot, you can see a few here. There's Evergreen, North on 405, Overlake, um, Northwest Hospital. There's plenty of great places to get care. If you're an older person who's broken a hip or a younger person with a sports injury. Um, so inshallah, just go where it's most convenient to you. But in those few instances I mentioned, please keep Seattle and Harborview in mind. All right, um, after tonight, if you wanna read more about some of the things that we talked about, uh, you can go online. Um, the internet is amazing in how much good information and bad information there is out there. Uh, this website provides a lot of reliable, vetted information about bone and joint problems. Um, you can search OrthoInfo or, or take down the link and uh, you'll be able to read more about some of the things we talked about tonight. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the very motivated students and young professionals who are uh, organizing activities through our Muslim Health Professionals group. Um, you can learn more about the group at this website. Um, and a lot of people who visit the website um, end up joining our listserv or become people that are interested in learning more about these issues. Um, and we can connect you with Muslims in the community who take care of these very problems. So looking to the future, um, you know, surgery and medicine are going to be more advanced. Uh, some of the treatments that we have today may not be here in 10 or 15 years because medicine's always changing. It's not like math. Math books are the same or relatively the same. I don't want to insult any mathematicians. Uh, but, but science is always changing. Um, and so, inshallah, we can be humble enough to realize that we may not know the answer to something, but maybe down the road we'll find the right answer for it. And don't always go for the newer thing. It's not always better, including MRIs. So in sum, bone and joint problems are common. They affect people of all ages. 
Um, it's important to start the conversation with your primary care doctor if it's an everyday ache or go see a specialist. And if you have signs or symptoms that might be an emergency, make sure you get the right care that day. Um, and I'm happy to take uh, email questions too if people um, want to follow up on anything that we've talked about tonight or um, uh, you're uh, not comfortable saying in person, I'm happy to speak by email uh, just as a, as a friend um, and uh, I'll hopefully get you to the right doctor inshallah. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so jogging on a treadmill um, is generally better, or on a track, is generally better than pavement because it's, it's better than pavement um, just because it's softer and treadmills always have a little bit of suspension built into them. Um, you know, there are people who go their whole lives running without an issue, but we know that it's, a, it's one of the common reasons why people wear out their knees. I mean, if you're somebody who already has knee pain, uh, but you like to do that as a form of exercise, uh, going to a track or, or a treadmill uh, or grass, uh, those are all better options than running on pavement, um, even if you have great shoes. Um, yeah. 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 So running on sand, actually, um, it's people here have seen pictures of people running on the beach, like in the movies. It's it. It's actually it can actually be very nice because the the sand right next to the water is very soft. Um, but since you brought it up, I'll mention that if you run in deeper sand, your foot can get caught, and there's a twisting movement every time you lift your foot. And running on sand can actually be. <laughs> very dangerous if you're somebody who has knee problems already um, or if you've injured your ACL or other ligaments in your knee. So uh, go closer to the water, I guess is the, the advice I have. Yeah. I spent some time in Egypt and noticed that a lot of people young, in the 50s and they are young, they have knee problems and it's like everybody. Yeah. Is that something you like to smile with malnutrition? Yeah, so... Um, it's not, it doesn't exist to me after this. It's not athletic as it is. I, so, Ahi uh, brings up a great question, which is, you know, he referenced Egypt, but actually, uh, here in the United States, um, hip and knee wear, hip and knee arthritis, um, is actually uh, very, very common. Uh, it's usually in a little bit older age, usually after the age of 60. There are other reasons why people in Egypt may have wear of their joints earlier on. And I'm going to speculate, but there's a few things. Um, there are some bugs in Egypt that are also found in other parts of the, the world and actually some parts of the United States that can cause arthritis. Um, you may have heard of, for example, of like Lyme disease, which here in the US is usually only in the Northeast. But Lyme disease is caused by a tick and that tick can actually create arthritis in a joint. And if somebody has that happen and it's not treated, then they can go to wear their joint at a much younger age. Uh, I don't know that Lyme disease is, is as common in Egypt, but that's one example. Um, another reason to wear out your joints early is if you've had an injury. If you've broken a bone that's at the joint or if you've had a really bad injury to a joint and you didn't get therapy or didn't get surgery if you needed it, the lining of the joint is going to be off and that wears things out much sooner. Um, you know, I haven't lived in Egypt but my family is from Egypt and I've visited over the years. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody walking across the street who gets hit by a small pickup truck. People pick him up and they just go back to their day and they may not have the money to go to a hospital. And I mean, it's, it's, you're talking about a different environment and that person may have broken a bone or hurt a joint and they just walk it off. Of course, a lot of people have access to care and there are parts of Egypt where you can get fantastic health care. Um, if you're of a certain population and so 
Um, it's a great question. I don't know that we can answer it tonight, but there are a lot of other reasons why somebody can wear a joint at a younger age than 60 or 70. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so for everybody in the room, bursitis is inflammation of the lining on the outside of a joint. We all have bursas uh, on the back of our elbows, on our knees, the back of our ankles, and our hips. Um, it helps your skin and muscle to move smoothly over those joints. Um, and some people can have inflammation. And usually what that means is that in some part of that movement, it creates it generates a lot of pain. Um, usually the first step in treating bursitis is to calm the inflammation down with anti-inflammatory medications. But you're describing somebody who's had this for a long time, who probably has tried a number of these things. And who could be, yeah, so it gets complicated. There are times when, <laughs> it's okay. There are times when surgery for bursitis can be helpful. Um, it's, this is a little bit, it's a little bit extreme and it may not give you the result that you're hoping for, but you can actually do a surgery to take away that lining completely. Um, one of the most common places that people develop bursitis is actually above their shoulder. Your shoulder blade has a part that comes and sits right here, and the space between your shoulder blade and your shoulder joint has a bursa. And that can actually get inflamed. Um, it's called subacromial bursitis. It's one of the more common kinds of chronic bursitis. And actually, surgery involves basically washing that whole area, just cleaning all the bursa away, and people have a lot of relief from it. Um, so, I think, I think you know, you're, you're getting at, a, at an issue that is a little bit more advanced than most people are facing. And it's important to, dis to see a specialist who focuses on inflammation and, and consider seeing somebody who offers surgery to remove that bursa if this is something that's been going on. That's, that's my thought. So those are absolutely important things to mention. Um, unfortunately, uh, obesity is a very common issue in the United States. People who are grossly or significantly overweight. And when you're overweight, you're carrying that load around on your joints. Um, that can actually be a reason to develop arthritis at a younger age. Um, and oftentimes when people have tried those early steps like inflammatory medications or physical therapy, they visit with their doctor and the first step is to work out a way to help that person lose some of their weight. Um, it's gonna be better for your joints if you're able to make those changes. And it's hard because genetics and a lot of other things play into it. Um, and you'll be, if you end up needing surgery, you'll be better off recovering from the surgery if you're able to reduce your weight. Um, and so it is a common, it is a common cause um, and a challenge for people who have worn out their joints. The other thing that you mentioned is over and under pronation. Uh, and what he's describing is the alignment of somebody's foot and ankle when they're walking. Um, if you, either as a child growing up or as an adult, have developed bad alignment of your ankles, hips, your knees, that can cause wear of the joint. We had a question earlier about, is it just rotating your shoulder, move it? Well, you can imagine that rotating in a way that's twisted <clears throat> or pointed in the wrong direction can wear that joint out sooner. Um, I have flat feet and people who have flat feet can actually develop more wear of their ankle because their body weight is 
going through their foot in a different way than other people might. Um, I don't know if obesity and foot alignment are the most common reasons, but they definitely can be involved and can contribute to your arthritis. Uh, weightlifting is a great way to be healthy, to build bone strength. In addition to muscle strength, people think that weightlifting is all about getting stronger muscles, but the right kind of weightlifting can also really strengthen your bones because it's a way of safely loading your bones. Having said that, there are people who do heavy weightlifting, either for sport or because they think it's going to make them uh, bigger or faster. And I would just say anytime you're thinking about doing something like that, it's important to talk to somebody who can work with you <coughs> on a good program for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I didn't mention them today, but <coughs> personal trainers can help you to develop an exercise program, one that's safe and can help you on your technique. If you're somebody that's really into heavy weightlifting, they can make sure that you're doing it with the right technique uh, and uh, with lower risk of injuring your bones and joints. Um, but as a general rule, it's a, it's a good thing. And if, if it's what you like to do to exercise, you should do it. Just try to find a safe way to do it. What's that? Well, uh, your body's used to a normal amount of loading. If you exceed that loading a little bit, you develop stronger muscles. If you exceed it a lot, you then may wear out the joint. And if even if you do a normal amount of loading, but you do it two times a day, five days a week, 50 weeks of the year, you can develop what's called an overuse injury. You started out doing something that was normal, but because you're doing it so much, you've started to cause wear, or pain, or inflammation. And the, the first thing that you're going to hear when you speak with your doctor is, take a break. Um, we actually see it in youth who are starting to play a lot more sports uh, year-round. It used to be that you only you know, played soccer in the fall or baseball in the summer, but some kids want to be competitive and they play year-round. Um, and what started out as a normal activity ends up wearing on their joints. And so um, that's another thing. And it's, you know, it's common sense. If something hurts, stop doing it. And, uh, but talk to your doctor if it's something that's been going on. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, RA is rheumatoid arthritis. It's one of the types of arthritis that's related to inflammation from the body as opposed to just everyday wear and tear. If you think that you have signs of arthritis um, and you've already discussed it with your primary care doctor, uh, the next best person to talk to is a rheumatologist. Rheumatologists are doctors who have trained in uh, managing these problems, first understanding them, finding out if that's the problem that you have, and then there are actually great medications for helping to calm down the inflammation. Uh, decades ago, people used to calm inflammation by just being treated with steroids. Steroids are normal hormones in our body, but you can actually give them in pill form or injections to try to knock down inflammation with a lot of side effects. And alhamdulillah, We've actually developed a lot of more, a lot more sophisticated ways to treat inflammation, uh, including special drugs that can target the parts of your immune system that are causing the rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and people who used to have um, joint replacements at the age of 40 because they have a reason for earlier wear and tear because of RA are now living much uh, longer and going much longer time without needing a joint replacement um, because of these medications. So um, if, uh, if you haven't already, you can look up a rheumatologist in your health insurance directory or just ask your regular doctor, and that would be a great person to talk to. Yeah, I, well, there's, there's all, there are always other options. Um, because rheumatoid arthritis is related to inflammation, doing things like certain exercises or physical therapy can help, but it's not really going to take care of the underlying cause. Um, one of the things that we didn't talk about tonight is 
trying to calm down inflammation inside of a joint using an injection. I talked about pulling fluid out, but you can actually put a medication in, like a steroid that's supposed to stay just in that joint, um, or other types of medications that we won't go into. Um, but that can actually calm the inflammation down. And there are people who have RA who benefit from injections into a joint. Um, RA can affect joints that you can't really treat that way though. And there are other kinds of arthritis that affect, for example, the connection between your pelvis and your back. Um, and it's really the best options we have at this point when that becomes more severe are, are medications. Um, I see, I, as I understand your question, you're saying, is there a way to prevent RA from becoming worse if you think that you've already had it? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, and that's a conversation to have with the rheumatologist. They can help you find the right time to start those medications that calm the inflammation down and calm the immune system down. Um, because if you calm the immune system down, then the joint wear happens at a slower rate. Yeah, so uh, really what it comes down to is, is a balanced diet. Um, there are a lot of fad diets out there. Um, the most important thing is to eat a balanced diet. Make sure that you're getting enough vitamins and minerals. If you're not, you can think about taking a supplement. Uh, get the generic brand at the store. Um, we talked earlier a little bit about vitamin D and calcium. Uh, those are important for your bone health, but they're actually important for other things in your body as well. Um, and so there's other benefits from taking, making sure that you get enough. Um, and that's it, there, there's, no, there's no magic, ma there's no magic diet. Um, if you're somebody who has certain uh, things lacking in your body, like a certain vitamin or a mineral, um, that's something that you really should talk to your primary doctor about. They usually find it on a blood test if they're suspicious for it. Um, you can follow that blood test over time while you're taking the supplement to see if it's getting better. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Does calcium help adults? I, I, I thought just children, when they grow up, during that process, the calcium is very important. But yeah. when you reach, you know, after 20, 20s, you don't need calcium. I'm not sure what I'll choose that. So I think that's a great question. Um, your body is actually constantly changing the bone. You're actually always making new bone. You're taking old bone away and you're laying down new bone. Even if you don't break anything, it happens all the time. And SubhanAllah, it's one of the only things in the body that's constantly changing itself and can repair itself. Um, that's why broken bones heal, just by letting them rest, for instance. Because your body's always changing over, uh, it needs the supplies to do that. And um, calcium is one of the minerals that your body uses along with phosphate to lay down new bone. So you need a supply of that from somewhere. If you aren't taking it in from your diet, your body's gonna try to get it in other ways and that can, it gets into other things that I think are uh, outside of tonight's topic, but uh, suffice it to say that you need the calcium uh, and those minerals in your diet so that your body can build the bone. It, that's literally what it comes down to. It is true that your bone density, the strength of your bone, is set at a relatively young age, um, uh, by your early 20s, actually. So your nutrition and your exercise uh, early on in life is actually really important. Um, but, there, there, but, but even if you're 30, 40, 50, 60, obviously there's things you can do um, to try to foster strong bones and making sure you have enough calcium and the phosphate and vitamin D is one of those things. Well, <laughs> you know, it, you know, milk. It's uh, it, it's funny. I mean, milk is good for you, but there are actually a, a lot of other ways to get calcium in your diet. Uh, mashallah, the milk industry in, Amer in the United States is a very big industry, and we all saw the milk posters growing up. And milk has its benefits. Cow milk, I mean. Um, 
but milk also has fat and it has other things. And there are people, for example, who are lactose intolerant, who can't drink milk without developing stomach and bowel problems. So um, there are other foods that actually have a ton of calcium, broccoli, for instance. And you can just Google foods with calcium. You can find a lot of other things that provide calcium and vitamin D, and you can get them in your diet that way. Go ahead. Yeah, that's, so that's a great question. Um, the, the type, the form that it comes in, liquid or capsule, um, isn't as important as the type of vitamin D. Um, we, we won't go into chemistry, but vitamin D actually gets made in stages. There's a stage that happens in your skin when you absorb sunlight. There's a different stage that happens in your kidney. There's one that happens in your liver. Um, your body needs the final product to be able to actually use the vitamin D to do other things, including absorb calcium from your diet. Um, so the best, there's a, there's, a, there's a form of vitamin D called uh, calcitriol, which is sort of like the end stage. If you take that form of it, your body doesn't necessarily need to go through the other steps to make vitamin D that's active or that can work. Um, I don't, e I don't even know that it's available to take in its like, you know, earlier forms, but that's the most important thing, is to take vitamin D that's already reached that step, so your body can use it right away. Um, and inshallah, your kidneys and liver can help, but if you are somebody who has problems, that kind of bypasses all those things. Thank you, Dr. Oyumi, for, for your presentation, for your time. Uh, if you like this type of lectures, we want to do more often, at least once a month. So give us feedback as to what you like, what you don't like, what you want to see more, so we can bring uh, that type of uh, speakers. Thank you for attending. Thank you so much.